Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 692, and today is October 17th, 2024. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Lansloan. We got a lot to get through on today's show, but first, just want to mention where people could find, share, and subscribe to the show. Everything that you could do, you know, subscribing to it, sharing it out there, putting it on your social media, recommending it to your friends and family, all that does help the show. We continue to grow here, and I really appreciate the base of this show who helps that to happen. We are, of course, hosted through the Libertarian Institute. I repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, or Odyssey for the video version of the show. It's up anywhere you could listen to audio podcasts. And follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anslone underscore, where I post all my work. All right, let's get into it for today. This first one, Dave DeCamp, October 16th, antiwar.com. Zelensky unveils victory plan, but no sign it has support from the West. So Ukrainian President Zelensky addressed the Ukrainian parliament on Wednesday and unveiled his so-called victory plan, but there is no sign of any Ukrainian Western backers will support his proposals. So Zelensky's plan includes five points and three classified sections that he did not make public. The plan essentially is a list of demands that Zelensky has been making of the U.S. and NATO for months. He claimed that the plan was implemented. Ukraine may be able to end the war no later than next year. One point is for Ukraine to receive a formal invitation to join NATO, but there's no sign the alliance will be willing to do that anytime in the near future, and Ukrainian neutrality will be a key Russian demand for any peace deal to end the conflict. The plan calls for more air defenses and for NATO countries to help shoot down Russian missiles over Ukraine, which would mean direct NATO involvement in the war. NATO countries have previously rejected the Ukrainian request to in intercept Russian missiles and drones. So another point in the plan calls for support for Ukraine to use NATO-provided missiles to launch long-range strikes inside Russia, an escalation that would risk nuclear war. So far, the U.S. and U.K. have rejected Zelensky's repeated request for help with long-range strikes. The Ukrainian, a Ukrainian member of parliament and a member of the European Solidarity Party criticized Zelensky's plan. He said, first of all, it's not a plan. Plan means something with concrete steps. It's kind of a wish list from Ukraine for our partners, how they can and should support us. And it doesn't look realistic. We are, we were waiting for some real serious conversation about the situation and the strategy, and this is not that. Zelensky unveiled the plan as Russia continued to make advances in eastern Ukraine, and the member of parliament called the uh, plan contradictory. Later on Wednesday, Zelensky spoke by phone with Biden, but the White House showed no sign that it supported the victory plan. When asked about it, White House press secretary said, that's third plan and let them speak to it. Despite no clear path to the Ukrainian victory, the U.S. still continues to fuel the war, and Zelensky's aide said Tuesday that American politicians are pressuring the Ukrainian government to lower the conscription age to 18. And so, you, you know, in a way, I really do feel bad for not Zelensky in particular, but the Ukrainians, and in a sense Zelensky because he is the one who bought and sold this to his people, but they really did believe, I guess, that America would give them the support that they think that they needed to win the war. The reality was that could never happen because that level of support would have meant direct war between NATO and Russia, and the from the start, Biden was clear that that wasn't a step that he wanted to take. Now, they certainly have skirted the line several times throughout this conflict, but now we're getting to the point where any further escalations that will really help the Ukrainians keep fighting will violate significant Russian red lines. And Russia recently changed their nuclear doctrine to reflect this, and I think as a real sign to Washington, like, hey, we mean it this time, do not endorse the long-range strikes into Russian territory. And so, now 
uh, the the U.S. and Ukraine are basically in a situation where the U.S. has to back away what it's told Ukraine for the past two and a half years, which is we will give you whatever it takes for as long as it takes. You had the full backing of the West. We interpret this war as an existential threat to the international order ruled by the United States of America. And for that reason, we will fight for the Ukrainians as if we were fighting for any uh, uh, other NATO state essentially is what they were doing and what they were saying. And obviously that's not what they're doing now because they're not giving Ukraine the weapons that they need to fight Russia. And now the Ukrainians are losing badly. And rather than, you know, give them more advanced weapons, we're saying, well, throw more of your young men into the meat grinder here. Uh, the U S is giving Ukraine some weapons, but these are all systems that they've previously had. So during Zelensky's call, uh, Biden announced a new $425 million weapons package for Ukraine. According to the Pentagon, this is a list of the weapon systems. The additional munitions for the National Advanced Surface to Air Missile System, RIM 7 missiles to support air defense. I believe those are the ones that are fired from the F 16s. Uh, Stinger anti aircraft missiles, those are the shoulder fire systems. Ammunition for high Mars air to ground munitions. I'm interested to know what these are and if they are fired from the uh, F-16s. Obviously, the JASSMs, the long-range cruise missiles with a range of about 230 miles, can be fired from F-16s and would be air-to-ground munitions. Uh, so that's, you know, whenever they say something very vague like that, it should raise an eyebrow and, and we should express some concern. Uh, they also say 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter artillery ammunition. They do not say if those 155 millimeter shells are cluster variant or not tow missiles javelin and at4 anti-armor systems high mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles small arms and ammunition grenades thermals and training equipment demolitions equipment ammunition spare parts ancillary equipment service training and transportation all right, so that's what I had on Ukraine for today. Let's move on and talk about Israel. First up here, this one from October 15th, Dave DeCamp, Antiwar.com. I mentioned this letter on the last show, but Dave has a nice write up here, so we'll go over it this way. A report U.S. gives Israel until after the U.S. election to ease starving of the Palestinians. So the Biden administration has given Israel until after the U.S. presidential election to ease the starving of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, according to a letter obtained by Atsios. The letter was written by Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and was sent on Wednesday and gave Israel 30 days to allow more aid deliveries into Gaza and to take other steps to improve the humanitarian situation for the people there. The letter says that failure to implement these measures will have implications for U.S. policy under NSM-20 and relevant U.S. laws, which involve weapon supplies, referring to foreign assistance laws that prohibit U.S. military aid to countries blocking deliveries. The U.S. Government agencies have previously concluded that Israel was deliberately blocking aid, but Blinken overrode those concerns to ensure U.S. weapons continue to flow to Israel. While his letter hints that Israel failure to take the steps the U.S. is asking for could impact military aid, it doesn't threaten to cut off weapon shipments. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller was asked on Tuesday what the consensus would be for Israel if they did not comply, and of course he wouldn't say. The letter comes two weeks after Israel cut off all aid deliveries to northern Gaza and ordered the estimated three to 400,000 Palestinians in the area to evacuate to the south. Israeli media has reported that Israel is carrying out a scaled-down version of what they call the General's Plan, which, if completed, would result in the complete ethnic cleansing of northern Gaza and the extermination of anyone who stayed behind, either by bullet or by starvation. Even before Israel began implementing the plan, aid deliveries deliveries in Gaza reached an all-time low. Blinken in Austin's letter said the amount of assistance entering Gaza in September was the lowest of any month during the past year. The letter calls for Israel to allow 350 aid trucks to enter Gaza on a daily basis, to enact humanitarian pauses, to allow for the distribution of aid, and for allow over 1 million Palestinians taking refuge at the Al-Mawasi coastal camp move more inland before the winter. 
In an apparent response to the letter, Israel said on Monday that it allowed 30 aid trucks to enter Gaza, how, northern Gaza. However, Gaza's mini, media office denied that the trucks came in, calling the claim lies. And imagine if they said, we want 350 trucks. The country that gave you $20 billion in weapons over the past year asked you to allow 350 trucks to enter Gaza every day. And you said, oh, we'll do 30 and pretend that's some kind of step in the right direction. I, I mean, I'm not trying to make light of this situation. It's just, it, it, it's really comical, right? Like if, if you were telling this story and people thought, you know, you're, you're writing a book or something like that. It would obviously have to be a comedy because nobody would think in a serious environment that it would play out in this way. Now, there's a lot of reason to think, of course, that the White House really won't follow through with any threats. But there's this new article from Politico that essentially confirms this. And I put this together on my Twitter account. So if you don't, follow me on ads because occasionally if the mainstream media has a really important report, I will pick out the most important quotes from it. That way you could get the substance without getting the propaganda. Uh, if I don't have time to do like a full write-up at antiwar.com or the Institute. So According to Politico, White House officials informed aid groups that the administration would not condition arms transfers to Israel because Tel Aviv is just too important to Washington. So this is quoting from the article. The top U.S. official working on the humanitarian situation in Gaza told aid groups in August that the U.S. would not consider withholding weapons from Israel for blocking food and medicine from entering the enclave, a rare omission by some in the administration. At the August 29th meeting in Washington, Lisi Grande told leaders of more than a dozen aid organizations that the U.S. could potentially consider other tactics to convince Israel to allow life-saving aid into Gaza, such as applying pressure through the United Nations, but stressed that the administration would continue to support Israel and would not delay or stop weapons shipments. A humanitarian aid official who attended the meeting said Grande noted that Israel is in a very tight circle of a few allies that the U.S. will will not oppose, nor will it hold back anything they want. She was sort of saying, with certain allies, we can't play the bad cop, the aid official told Politico. While Grande's assessments were made more than a month ago, her candid assessment of the odds of the U.S. taking action on weapons for Israel raises questions about the seriousness of the letter that we were just talking about. So, in the nearly two-hour long meeting, aid represented detailed ways in which Israel was blocking aid access in Gaza and raised concerns about the U.S. refusing to restrict weapons shipments. They also argued to Grande that Israel was violating international humanitarian law, which broadly prohibits countries from restricting or blocking humanitarian aid or the movement of humanitarian workers in conflict zones. She was saying that the rules don't apply to Israel, one person who attended the meeting told Politico. Multiple attendees described Grande's worms as alarmingly blunt and forthcoming, surprising many in the room. And so just a, a couple more things that I want to point out here. So for most people, yes, we have known this is going on all along, that Israel is not laying in enough aid, and it's meant to starve the, the people of Palestine to death and make them, I, I guess, maybe so desperate that one day that they're willing to leave after all the infrastructure is destroyed, all their homes are gone, they're all displaced people, they're barely gaining enough food to survive, they can't keep their children healthy, uh, you know, when, when they create this living hell for the Palestinians, uh, I, I'm guessing that the Israelis are hoping they're either going to to leave again, go somewhere in Africa, or then, uh, or or just die and not be a problem for the Israelis anymore. So, the U.S. the U.S. official here is just openly saying that we understand that this is the Israeli policy that they are blocking aid from entering Gaza. However, we don't do anything when it comes to the Israelis. It's just it's just off limits when it comes to the Israelis. I, I mean, this is it, it's just utterly baffling. And again. You, you know, this doesn't even make sense if, if you're trying to write it out and explain it. It's just it's absolute lunacy from the White House that you would say there are some countries that even if they're committing a genocide, we don't care. We, we just will we'll give them anything they want. It's not even that we're going to refuse to condemn them. Right. That she's 
you know, it's not just that, but she's saying we're going to give them all the aid, all the weapons that they asked for, even as they're committing a genocide. I, I mean, it, it's it's really hard to comprehend. But at the same time, everything that we have seen happen over the past year makes it clear that this really is the policy, that this isn't just some incorrect reporting from Politico, that this is what we thought the policy was. And this is that's just an omission from the White House that that truly is the policy. It, it's sickening and uh, just uh, absolutely horrific. So this next article report, Netanyahu approves set of targets to hit inside Iran. Uh, so this is the Nets' major escalation in the Middle East. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has approved a set of targets for Israel to strike inside Iran, ABC News reported on Wednesday, citing an Israeli source. CNN also reported that Israel's plans to attack Iran were ready. Neither report gave a timeline nor provided any details about what targets Israel planned to hit. Israel is expected to strike targets before the U.S. presidential election on November 5th. The U.S. has been coordinating with Israel on its plans to strike Iran following the Iranian missile barrage that was fired at Israel on October 1st, which was retaliation for a string of Israeli escalations in the region. The Washington Post reported this week that Netanyahu told President Biden in a phone call last week that Israel would target military sites in Iran and not oil or nuclear facilities, which <laughs> there's a little bit of an omission there that, that nobody's uh, really pointed out in the mainstream media, that if he's only targeting military sites and he's agreeing not to target nuclear sites, well, that means the nuclear facilities are civilian, aren't they? So, however, in response to the report, Netanyahu's office said in a statement, we listen to the opinions of the U.S., but we will make our final decisions based on our national interest. The U.S. and Israeli officials believe an attack on Iran could lead to a full-blown war. Iran has warned that it will launch a decisive response if Israel attacks. Iran, while making all-out efforts to protect peace and security, of, uh, Iran, while making all-out, so this is uh, from the Iranian foreign minister, okay? So Iran, while making all-out efforts to protect the peace and security of the region, is fully prepared for decisive and re regretful response to any adventures. Uh, the U.S. may support an Israeli attack on Iran. It's unclear of what that support would be, likely for sure logistics and intelligence, if not uh, deeper and more substantial support that could include uh, actually carrying out the strikes. And of course, we already deployed the THAAD missile defense system to Israel those 100 American troops in a war zone. All right, next up, a couple stories on Lebanon. This first one from Jason Ditz. Israeli tank attacks UN peacekeepers watchtower in southern Lebanon. So adding to the ongoing tensions with the international community during the recent invasion of southern Lebanon, an Israeli tank was reported today to have attacked an observation tower belonging to UNIFIL, the peace peacekeepers in southern Lebanon. There were no casualties reported in this particular Israeli attack on the peacekeepers, but UNIFIL did report that two cameras on the site were destroyed by the tank fire and that the watchtower itself sustained damage. The official statement from the UN condemned the attack, warning that personnel and property of the peacekeeping force needs to be treated as uh, untouchable at all times. On Sunday, Israeli tanks smashed into the peacekeepers uh, near uh, one of the peacekeeping bases in southern Lebanon. It was not clear why they did so, but it came amid Pres Prime Minister Netanyahu's demand that the UN withdraw all troops from Lebanon. And, you know, attacking that tower and taking out the cameras seems like maybe they are preparing for something bigger. I'm not saying they're going to really like full on attack the uh, UN peacekeeper base there, but they may be playing something in the region or to carry out some kind of attack. I think they're going to keep doing minor things to try to make it so that the UNIFIL mission decides it's just better to get out of the way uh, than risk ending up being shot at by the Israelis and maybe losing some of their peacekeepers. All right, next up here, this one from Dave DeCamp, antiwar.com, October 16th. 
Israeli airstrike kills at least 15 in Lebanese town of Kwana, the site of previous Israeli massacres. So on Wednesday, Israeli airstrikes pounded the southern Lebanese town of Kwana, killing at least 15 people and wounding dozens more. The Israeli strikes on Kwana flattened multiple buildings and rescuers are still digging through the rubble, meaning the death toll could rise. Israel claims that it targeted uh, somebody described as a Hezbollah commander who was in charge of the Kwana area, but there is no confirmation from Hezbollah that he was killed. Israel has a history of massacring civilians in Kwana, including in 1996 when Israel shelled a UN compound that was sheltering 800 civilians. The attack killed 106 civilians and wounded many more. During the 2006 war, Israeli strikes on a residential building in Kwana killed nearly three dozen people, a third of them children. Kwana always gets its share, the mayor told the Associated Press. The breakdown of casualties is unclear at this time, but Israeli strikes on Lebanon over the past month have killed many civilians. Over 100 Lebanese civilians were killed in just 11 days of Israeli strikes on Lebanon starting on uh, September 23rd. All right, last up here today, this one is kind of just developing news, so I don't have a whole lot of details outside of what the U.S. government has put out, but the White House deployed B-52s, or B-2s, excuse me, to bomb Yemen. Uh, this is the statement from CENTCOM that I was able to find this morning. So CENTCOM forces conducted multiple precision airstrikes on numerous Aram-Bat Houthi weapons storage facilities within Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen that could various amounts of conventional weapons used to target the U.S. and international military and civilian vessels navigating international waters throughout the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. These actions were taken to degrade the Houthi capabilities to continue their reckless and unlawful attacks on international commercial shipping and on U.S. coalition and merchant personnel and vessels in the Red Sea. al bab Mabdeb Strait and the Gulf of Aden, and to degrade their ability to threaten regional partners. CENTCOM forces also target the Houthis' hardened underground facilities, housing missiles, weapons component, and other munitions used to target military and civilian vessels throughout the region. U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy assets, including U.S. Air Force B-52 Spirit long-range stealth bombers, were a part of the operation. The deployment of the B-52 bomber demonstrates U.S. global strike capabilities to reach these targets when necessary, anytime, anywhere. Our battle damage assessments are underway and do not indicate civilian casualties. We will provide updated information as it comes available. So, of course, that was from the U.S. government. I saw some pictures this morning. It looked like some pretty heavy bombing. So I am somewhat suspicious of the claim that they didn't kill any civilians in these attacks. Uh, you, you know, this this is just completely counterproductive, the, these attacks against the Houthis. Um the U.S. has a lot of things that it could be doing to de-escalate the situation in the Red Sea and stop the Houthi attacks on shipping. And one of those would just be, I mean, possibly even to just allow Saudi Arabia to reach the peace deal with Yemen and make a condition of it, these attacks ending. I mean, there there is like just other leverage in political uh, economic leverage that the U.S. has or could exercise over the Houthis. But the easiest thing to do is just to get Israel to stop the genocide in Yemen. That's the only reason, or excuse me, in Gaza. That's the only reason that these attacks are still going on. If the, if Israel reaches a ceasefire in Gaza that these attacks end. And the U.S. has even assessed that. The same with the fighting in Hez with Hezbollah. So the the other thing the U.S. could do, I think, is nothing. I, I, I mean, it seems that the Houthis are kind of getting what they want with the U.S. having to put all these military assets to, to take on the Houthis. It makes them seem like a lot more prominent and a lot tougher of a force than... Uh, they they actually are for a group of people who can only control, I mean, a large swath of the Yemeni population, sure, but only a small percentage of the land territory of Yemen is actually controlled by the Houthis. And so, in, in a sense, waging this war against them, I think, probably empowers them, if not locally, uh, regionally, quite a bit. So... 
it just unbelievable that we're sending the B-52s to bomb Yemen now. Uh, we have military assets in the region. I, I do wonder if, you know, seeing the Thads deployed to to Israel, this bombing, uh, using the B-52s, maybe the U.S. is really concerned that Israel is preparing a major strike on Iran that is the kind that would kick off a regional war. And so a part of what we're doing to help Israel out here is hitting any potential targets in Lebanon, because that's one of the places that, that Israel could be hit from. Of course, when you consider air defenses and air defense systems and things like that. You know, Israel isn't a huge country like, say, Ukraine, so it probably doesn't take as many systems and radars to really monitor and cover the airspace. But, you know, Yemen is located in a different direction, you know, south of Israel than Iran, which is um, east. And so it may create some complications for Israel and their air defense systems that they have to worry about attacks coming from the north from Hezbollah and, you know, maybe even cruise missiles and drones that they're able to fling out over the Mediterranean Sea, then come back into Israel from the west. Uh, the Houthis being able to do the same thing from the south and the west. And then Iran and the Shia militias located to Israel's east, it, you know, it, coming under bombardment from all sides, I think it's probably going to be something that's more likely to overwhelm the Israeli air defense systems rather than the, just the attacks, say, coming from Iran only. And maybe this is one of the things that the U.S. is doing to try to help out Israel is to make it so that the uh, Houthis are kind of not in a position to carry out any attacks on Israel. Although the U.S. has been bombing the Houthis for nine months now, maybe 10, nine or 10 months now. And it, it hasn't degraded their capabilities at all. If anything, they've gotten even stronger and they've you know been able to conduct more sh attacks against international shipping and get more hits. And so. Uh, they've also carried out attacks directly in Israel, uh, landed a drone and a missile in Tel Aviv. And so the the Houthis are showing that they're a very capa competent and capable fighting force and that they have uh, missile capabilities, even amid a U.S. bombing campaign in their country. Maybe the B-52s hit targets that the U.S. Navy couldn't hit with their Tomahawk missiles in, in the uh, Red Sea or something like that. Uh, remains to be seen, but I don't see any reason why I would assume that this attack is going to be any more productive than the couple hundred others that the U.S. and U.K. have carried out over this year. All right, everybody, wrapping up the show for a day. Hope you enjoyed it. One more show out this week.